So uh, I wanted to start today's talk um, focusing on uh, the narratives uh, that were that are really important in terms of how we understand what happened in the uh, 1948 War of Independence for Israel and Nakba for the Palestinians. And I want to begin uh, focused on the Palestinian narrative. So what we're going to do is is a couple of things tonight. Just I want to sort of lay out some ideas about the Palestinian narrative. Um, I think. I can rely on some of you guys to help me fill out the Zionist narrative. We'll come back to that. So I want to start with the path. And then I want to um, finish up this section about halfway through today's class, focusing on um, an analysis um, yeah. of this, okay? So the analysis will feature um, the model that I started with, the systemic, regional and unit level factors um, to think about what happened in 1948. Okay, um, so I'm not really gonna use, for this section, I'm not gonna really use a PowerPoint. We'll stop at, after I do all this and we'll launch uh, my next section and we might have to extend the class by, by one class. Hopefully I'll be able to catch up, um, but we'll, we'll We'll start by thinking about the, the lead up to the six day war in the second half of the class. So it'll be about half and half. Okay. All right. Um, so uh, first of all, when you think about what happened in 1948 um, uh, from the Palestinian perspective, right? And by the way, it's very important that you understand like, Part of my approach here is to try to, so to speak, get inside the head of different of the different uh, actors, different uh, players in this political uh, and uh, military conflict, okay, um, and sort of see it from their perspective as a way to get a bigger um, and and a more fulsome understanding of the roots of this conflict. So um, just to begin with, you know, um, I think they would agree on this, both the Zionists and the Palestinians, that the Palestinians would see this as there as a tremendous failure, a tremendous failure. Um, they, uh, uh, they had wanted just like the Zionists to have their own political independence like Egypt, like Syria, um, uh, like Lebanon. And um, they looked at uh, the responsibility and they for sure saw a lot of the reasons for that failure of their inability to get independence. Um, hang on one second, I'm just gonna shut this door so it's easier. I'm, I'm in a different room today, so as you can see, they looked at one of the, they, they certainly looked at Israel or the, uh, as a, the primary reason for the, the failure, but also Britain, right? The, but they also looked at themselves. You know, there's a saying that you have one finger pointed outward, you have three fingers pointed right back at you. Um, and they, and, and Palestinian uh, scholars, Palestinian, but not just scholars, not just intellectuals think of it that way. Um, Palestinians understood at that time um, that this catastrophe or the Nakba, as they call it, um, their loss of their homeland to the Zionists was their loss. They lost it, right? Um, and it represented more than just the loss of their homeland, but the, the failure of 50 years of resistance to the British, to the Zionists, right? Everything we've been talking about in terms of, you know, uh, the various efforts to resist violently and through strikes in the 1920s, in the 1930s, um, and then uh, in the civil war between the Zionists and the Palestinians living in the and the mandate, 
just before the war of all the Arab nations, uh, all these Arab nations, not all of them, but um, you know, attacking uh, the nascent independent Jewish state, Israel. Um, all of those things failed, right? So that it wasn't just a little failure; it's a pretty big failure. Um, and 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 it and it took a long time, right? Like all of this led the the reasons for this failure were not just military mismatch. It, there was much more to it, right? Uh, the the failure, as I've been sort of talking about um, during the uh, yeshuv, uh, that the Palestinian people in the in the mandate failed to create a unified nation. Uh, they didn't build an effective national institutions. They didn't engage in serious state building. And that was all the more important considering the opposite was happening for the issue, right? The, the, the Jewish community in Mandate Palestine, British Mandate Palestine was um, very effective in building institutions that would last longer than the mandate that were separate from Britain, um, the Jewish agency, uh, the, the Mapai political party. Um, and uh, uh, so they were very, and, and unifying the country despite lots of divisions, which I'll talk to you about in a minute. The Palestinians, not, not so effective. Now, Jordan also uh, uh, contributed. Um, Right, Jordan Im immediately <laughs> after uh, the war annexed the West Bank, and um, and then Egypt um, took control by military administration, didn't an annex Gaza, um, uh, but 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 certainly took basically. If you think about the Palestinians from their perspective, their land was taken by Transjordan and Egypt the war was lost to the Zionists. So the Nakba though was much more than just the land. The Palestinians lost their homes, they lost their property, and now they were living as refugees. They're living as refugees inside historic Palestine, in the West Bank, in the Gaza Strip, in exile in Jordan, in exile in Egypt, in the exile in Lebanon, Syria, and their leadership is just totaled. Um, the leadership was exiled. Many uh, of the leaders were uh, internal refugees um, inside of uh, what is now Israel, unable to go back to the towns and the villages that they abandoned in the in the fighting. They had they basically they're faced with this choice: either integrate fully into the nations where they were, primarily Jordan, or remain in exile. And many of them choose to remain in exile. Those Palestinians who are remaining in Israel um, are second-class citizens. They're under a military administration. They have emergency regulations that are applied to them. Um, their land is confiscated, their movement is restricted. Many of them are forced to remain as internal refugees. Uh, they can't go back to their small towns that they left, um, that they abandoned during the fighting. Um, uh, and so this is their situation. Now, some of you may say to yourself, well, and, and, why did why did the Palestinians reject the offer of their own state? Not once, not twice, three times, right? Um, and you can just look at UN Resolution 181, uh, which is the United Nations offering a two-state solution, right? Um, the Palestinians looked at this and they said, this is just completely unjust. Right, and Michael, it's okay. You don't need to um, rebut this. There, there, this is just presenting a one-sided perspective from the Palestinians, but I, I, it's really important that we hear it and understand this perspective. Some of it may be persuasive, some of it may not be. Um, 
and then look at the Zionist perspective. We've, we've explored most of the Zionist perspective. We'll come back to it and, and to summarize some of these things. But I, I, I want you to know that that's, that that's the effort right here, right? So why reject the partition, right? First of all, from the Palestinians' perspective, it's completely unjust that they were the ones who lived on this land. The Jews who lived on it were a small minority. Um, the European settlers who had no claim to the land were dividing it up and giving them less than half or half of the land. Um, Zionists were a much smaller piece of the population in Palestine. They didn't own very much of the actual land um, relative to the entirety of the country. And so the Palestinians said, why should we take half a loaf when it's ours, morally ours, right? It's our land. Um, so they, and, and, and more importantly, from their perspective, by rejecting the partition and saying, no, we don't want what the UN is offering us, they weren't inviting the military in, you know, attacks from the Zionists. The Zion, the, from the perspective of the Palestinians, um, the, the Zionists started to wage war against the Palestinian people well before the Arab nations invaded on May the 15th. Before Jordan and the Arab uh, uh, League uh, invaded Syria, Jordan, Egypt, Iraq, Lebanon, there was already a war happening. And the Zionists, from the perspective of, of the Palestinians, were really the ones who were started that, right? They started attacking. And that the Zionists had an agenda that was too transparent to ignore. Their idea was ethnic cleansing. We are going to be pushed out of our land. And the goal here is, look, they want a Jewish majority country. And the only way that's going to happen is if we have to leave the place where we grew up, where our parents grew up, where our grandparents, right? Our homes, our, our villages, and, and, and we're going to be pushed out. That's what they're going to do. So from the perspective of the Palestinians, then a third piece is what happens in this war, right? What actually happens. From the Zionist war plans, their military occupation, uh, 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 operations, their military tactics, including what they did in towns like Lida, um, where they used military to terrorize the population and evacuate them, right? Mil artillery use against civilians uh, to evacuate villages and towns. And war propaganda by the Zionists to, to spread rumors. This is Operation Dalit uh, uh, to, to scare villagers so that they wouldn't have to use the military, that they could get the Palestinians to leave based on their fear. Um, that, that, that all of that, all of those military occupations, all that stuff from the Palestinian perspective was aimed at forcing an indigenous population out of their homes and out of their land. The Zionists were gonna replace them. The Zionists were gonna create this new state with a decisive Jewish majority. And, okay, so all of that's true. And that from, say the, Zion, say the Palestinians, but on top of all of this, we have ourselves to blame from our own weaknesses. At precisely the moment when the, air, when, the, when the British mandate ends, we have no leadership. We, all of our, our leadership was absent, right? We didn't have, there was no unified Arab command. Um, the Arab armies performed poorly. Um, they were not unified. The Arab, certainly the broader Arab people all across the Arab countries sympathized with the Palestinians. But the Arab regimes were still either influenced by Britain 
which is the major colonial power still there. Um, and more importantly, they're invading Palestine. Why? Not because they're so dedicated to helping the Palestinians, but because they want to get territory for themselves. They have selfish, whether it's uh, King Abdullah clearly seeking to expand his territory. He can't go up north into Syria. He's already lost that dream. Uh, he's going to go uh, west and annex the West Bank, right? So um, Egypt uh, has its own goals. Um, when, when the United Nations at the end of this war uh, passed Security Resolution 194, which says um, essentially the right of refugees to return, from the Palestinian perspective, this was completely and totally just. Um, it gives the Palestinians and all of their descendants the right to go back to their original homeland and their properties, or should they choose not to go, not because they can't, but be, should they choose not to go to be compensated. Um, and the reason why they feel like this is just, you could probably tell me, why, why would a Palestinian argue that that is completely what the, in keeping with, with their sense of morality, international morality? Yeah, go ahead, Ria. I, I think it's ironic that uh, the Inquisition, the Jews were either, were either forced to convert or kicked out. And there are families that have the key to the home that their family came from. Mm -hmm. And that was in 1492. So I can really understand the, 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 the perspective of a pe so people who are not internationalists, they're not experts, but suddenly they've, they've had to flee their home and they have the key. So I, that, this is not an isolated type of incident. I mean, a thing that would happen because it happened to us. Sure, and of course, you know, that's centuries prior to this, and this is a, in the 20, 20th century, in the middle of the 20th century, after World War II. But, but from the perspective of the Palestinians in terms of this, right, they were pushed out by an effort to, to clear them out of their homes by this Jewish army. Um, and uh, the, these are foreign settlers that have come in, and so they they have a moral and an internationally sanctioned right to fight off to fight back by all means necessary as they see it, including armed resistance. So that that's really important that we understand that because that hangs in the balance. That doesn't just go away. That's the belief of hundreds of thousands of Palestinians who are now refugees and exile from their homeland who believe that the United the, the world has said you have a right to go back and they have a moral right to go back, which supersedes what the nations might have even said because it was their land in the first place. And if they need to do so, they can engage in armed resistance because they have a it's a legitimate cause that has been just usurped from them. Now, so they've got this sense that they were the victims here with catastrophic impact and that they played a role, that their leadership was fractured and exiled and non-existent just the time that they needed leadership. But on top of that, the Arab countries that were supposed to help them um, were in the aftermath of this war, deliberately marginalizing them. Jordan was not interested in having an independent Palestinian state. They wanted the Palestinians to call themselves Jordanians and, and forbid, legally forbid them from using the term Palestinian, right? Uh, Egypt. Uh, yes, please. 
they didn't really have a national identity. They were not a state or a nation. They didn't have a government, right? So, right? That's correct. No, absolutely, so, Rosalie. So I, I don't understand why it became so important. I know you're going over all of this, but I still... No, no, I think it's a great question. Yeah, From the, so there was like in the first class when we talked about the emergence of Palestinian nationalism, and I came from a lot of different places, there was a sense uh, rather that, that with this, uh, this European construct, construct of a nation, right? It wasn't really an, uh, a, a, an, an a part of the language that was used or the culture of the uh, Arab world prior to the 19th, to the early part of the 20th century. Um, it was really like there was this empire, the Ottoman Empire that had been there for almost a thousand years, right? And there were different regions and there was an Islamic a leadership based leadership that was connected to the Turks. Um, so in response to that, there was this emerging sort of very tenuous um, Palestinian nationalism we can start to point to around the 1920s. Um, but, but truly it was the impact of Zionism and the British mandate and the anti-colonial movements that sort of sparked a growing awareness, a self-consciousness among Palestinian leaders right. of a national identity. So they did, by the time we get to 48, certainly have this idea of a national identity. But you're right, Rosalie. I never think, had it before. I mean, yeah, anybody really could have, wander in the, there in the lands. That is absolutely right. And I yeah. think it's important. Okay. Thing. But, but they also recognized that after the Right. So the war of 1948, first they were fighting against the Zionists. They reject UN uh, 181 as unjust. They're taking our land. They're dividing it in half. They're giving us the worst part of it. They're giving the Jews the best, more cultivable land. There, there are only 20% of the people here, and they're giving them 45% of the land. It's unfair. We're going to resist it. We're going to say no. They, and we're going to fight off the Jews yet again. We did it in 36 to 39. We're going to do it again now. Then when the Arab armies decide to come in, what I'm, I'm trying to point out is that from the Palestinian perspective, right, the, what they are thinking about is getting their own country, getting their own, pushing the Zionists out and, st and having an independent nation like Egypt, like Lebanon. Lebanon had just gotten their independence. Syria had just gotten their independence. So um, Egypt had only recently negotiated its independence from Britain. Um, and one second, I'm gonna come to you, Michael. Um, but, but, but my point is that for sure by 1948, 47, the Palestinians are thinking of this. And so the question that I was asking though, from their perspective is why would they reject the two, the smaller state that was offered in 37, and then again in, in, in 47, and instead opt for this war, right? Um, go ahead, Michael. I know you want to, you have a comment. Yeah, I just want to agree with you and Rosalie. Um, they did not have an aspiration for a state, and it only came as a consequence of the Jews coming back home. They remembered all of a sudden, why don't we have a state? As you said, it started in 1920. But the Jews were coming home much, much before that. In the turn of the century, Herzl, it was 1890, okay, that the Herzl started the, the first convention. So their, uh, their nationalism was a result, ironically, of the Zionist aspiration to go back home. And the fact that they, um, uh, 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 there is a new movement recently that they want to have one state solution, okay? But uh, my understanding is, my answer is, uh, we've seen this movie before, before 48, they could not live together. So this is really is the core of the problem that uh, they were so uh, object, uh, insisting on having the whole cake to themselves. So this is and, and and this is really important. I I I think there's a lot more to it than simply 
only a response to Zionism. I think there is a growing sense of Arab nationalism. Remember, there's three forms of nationalism, Arab, there's sort of pan-Arabic nationalism, there's an Islamic, uh, growing sense of Islamic uh, uh, pan-Arabic identity, but then there's independent states that are becoming uh, independent, you know, adopting the nation state in the aftermath of the collapse of the Ottomans and in response to the decline of colonial power, particularly the British, this anti-colonial movement. And the Palestinian intellectual elites and leaders wanted to participate in that, at just that like, like Lebanese leaders, like Egyptian leaders, like Syrian leaders. So there's more to it than just a resistance design is what's interesting about what the Palestinians experience. And I'm going to come to your uh, point, Ria, is that Whereas uh, it was clear which colonial empire, uh, right, Lebanon was resisting, France, Syria, France, uh, Egypt, Britain. Uh, for the Palestinian people in Palestine, the British mandate had Britain, had Zionists, as well as the, uh, the Palestinian uh, uh, people in that mandate. And so it was kind of, they they certainly saw Britain as an oppressive uh, mandate presence, right, a colonial presence, but they also saw the Zionists as well. And so I think, you know, there's this, this inchoate way in which this nationalist identity emerges, and that is one of the big problems. Whereas the Jews had a very big mismatch, right? The Jews had a nationalist idea from the eight, from at least as modern ways from 1896, 97 with Herzl, that was incredibly well articulated. They had a world Zionist organization that had been meeting every year. They had a Palestinian pre a presence in Palestine for uh, during the Ottoman Empire and, in, and into the 20th century for sure, as Michael points out. And, and there's this, they understood what they were doing and who they were. Uh, whereas the Palestinian people, are we part of the pan-Arab? Are we part of Syria? Are we part of Arab people? Do we have our own independent identity? Yes, Ria. Yeah, I'm sorry to do this, but we have to look back historically to the whole concept of nationalism and Napoleon's mm -hmm. uh, time, that there were little nation, there were, there were nation states. And Italy did not, uh, reunite until the 19th century, didn't become a country. So, um, and uh, Herzl was influenced by this European concept of nationalism, and that's the birth of Zionism, the, the modern nationalist state. So it's a complex story, and that Israel and the Palestinian people are merely part of something that goes way back and develops and changes. So, it, and, and you're bringing in the complications is wonderful because it's not a simple story at all. So thank you. But I also want to, you know, but thank you for saying about this, but I, I want to point out the mismatch here in terms of where this co consciousness culturally, as well as intellectually and politically, but just culturally, which is even deeper, um, comes out of, right? So Jewish culture um, and written documentation of the sense of identified identification for this land predates Palestinian nationalism by hundreds of years. Um, and so, and, and then and Ashkenazic Jews coming out of Europe, um, much more comfortable this idea of a national identity as a concept that makes sense from the European identity, um, then Arab intellectuals and political leaders who are starting to emerge into that sense of nationalism um, in the in the Arab Renaissance uh, around the turn of the 20th century. So it's it's less formulated and and it gives the Jewish people a little bit of an advantage. So great question, Rosalie. I did want to sort of sort of bracket out a little bit. So are we clear sort of from the perspective of the, from the perspective of the Zionists, right? And I think we've been over this a little bit 
further, and then I'm going to come to the sort of Egypt and Jordanian um, narratives before we move on. Um, from, from your understanding of what I've been over, from the perspective of the Zionists, uh, what explains their victory in 1948? And how should they, how should the world see it? How should they see it? Well, let's start with the Holocaust. What role does the, the tremendous uh, horror of the Holocaust play from their perspective? From whose perspective? From the Zionists. Now we're into the Zionist okay. thing. Okay. Go ahead, Sylvia. So I think it plays a, an enormous um, part because now, um, you know, we've been, we've been running, we've been running for uh, like 2000 years. I mean, we'd get, we'd get into a place for a hundred years or 200 years and then we had to go, but we couldn't go back to the Holy Land because we had been expe expelled from there. And, but the horror of the Holocaust woke people up to, um, and a lot of people really, up to um, that would maybe help to prevent it from happening again if uh, um, we were able to go back home. I like that, Michael, all at home, home, that we were able to go back home. Um, I think, I, so I think it's been, um, it was at that time, very important, uh, vitally important. I agree a hundred, so that's great. It, and Robin, go ahead. Yeah, I think also it's important to remember that, you know, the the many, what is it like a, a quarter of a million Jew, Eastern European Jews were in refugee camps, dislocated. Um, the countries wouldn't take them back, right? Poland said, oh, hell no. Um, Hungary, Czechoslovakia, all of these countries, and of course, Germany was, you know, destitute and, and nobody wants to go back there. And so, you know, you know, what is the role? What is the issue? I mean, you know, the Jews were like, they, you know, they also did not want to live in refugee camps. No other country was willing to relocate them and allow them to immigrate um what were they to do yes and i and i think both of these are really important so i think one of the mismatches again is that for the jews and we'll talk about how egypt and Trent and jordan and lebanon syria see this issue of the palestinians and even the palestinians but for the jews it's an existential it's op it's clearly an existential crisis and they're willing to, like they're 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 fighting for their lives, right? And it justifies on a moral basis, the Zionist cause. And thirdly, from a pragmatic perspective, the rest of the world couldn't deny, it was hard for any other country now to say, oh, you don't need your own country. Um, and the United States in particular, and pick out the leader of President Truman even more particularly, are feeling, a, tremendously guilty about turning away shiploads of uh, Im immigrants as this news becomes clear. And may maybe they don't feel guilty, but it's hard for them to maintain legitimacy uh, if they aren't going to do something in compensation for this. But certainly President Truman, confronted by his own State Department leaders after the war, after the war of 1948, we're told when, when Israel declares independence, his own State Department leaders say, hey, look, uh, I understand, you know, it's the, the Jews, it's the, you know, the Holocaust, but President Truman, oil is a internationally uh, important, you know, essential uh, uh, resource. The Arabs not all have not just um, uh, oil resources, but also have geographic resources, um, ports, access to uh, to land, uh, and traversing 
uh, Northern Africa into um, as well. Um, why would you, and, and if we're gonna be uh, thinking about our strategic needs, why alienate all of these Arab countries for a little piece of Jewish identity in a valueless area that doesn't have oil? And Truman looks at them and says, I'm going with my gut, I'm recognizing Israel. I mean, that is just uh, really quite extraordinary. Um, and part of it was, you know, the Holocaust convinced him how important that was. I'm sorry, I have to let my cat out of here. Okay, get out. <laughs> this is what happens when you teach at home. <laughs> I had, to, I had to kick socks out, sorry. Don't feel bad about socks. All right, one other thing I wanted to point out here um, about the Zionist narrative that I think we, I, I may not have. Um, uh, uh, okay, so um, there was this also this um, feeling among the Zionists that the war, the war part was the few against the many right? This little state that just was born against all the Arab nations, right? Um, and so the question was, how did, so just like the Palestinians are wondering, how did we lose, which I'm going to get to the other Arab countries in a minute, under those circumstances, um, from the Zionist perspective is how the heck did we win, right? And a big part of this was their total conviction to avoid another Holocaust uh, was just so powerful that everybody fought, right? And in fact, there were more Jewish soldiers fighting than Arab soldiers in the end. This idea of the few against many, because everybody fought, everybody fought. Um, uh, the feeling was that the Arab armies were just determined to wipe Israel out. And they had to fight to the end. And in the long run, as Sylvia was pointing out, and I think Robin was also pointing out, without a country, there was uh, it would be impossible to prevent another Holocaust, another effort to wipe the Jews out. So one other thing I mentioned from the perspective of the Palestinians, the refugees, from the perspectives of the Zionists. Uh, where did this, who's responsible for these refugees? From the Palestinians, it's the Zionists who engaged in ethnic cleansing and brutal, right? Just against civilians. I mean, if you've read a little bit of Ari Shavit's um, description of what happened in the town of Lida, which was abandoned by the Jordanian Arab uh, Legion, um, uh, there was a uh, all the Palestinian, all the Arabs in this city were were gathered in uh, a large mosque and a small mosque, and uh, one of the uh, Zionist military uh, uh, set off a saw uh, you know thought what he saw was a gun starting to be pointed at at them and launched a. A, a grenade launcher at that mosque and just it just killed like a couple hundred people at once. And then the rest of the people were exiled out. Um, so um, from the uh, from the perspective of the Arab Palestinians, you can see where they would say that the 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 refugee problem was they were running for their lives, and this was completely immoral. And the, it violated all norms of war. It was a military against civilians. Flip the table around. Let's get the, the Jewish, the Zionist perspective. I know Michael could give it to me. If you're, yeah, go I'm ahead. Sorry, I was, I was already. Uh, all I'm going to say is, uh, the Jews uh, felt um, uh, threatened by the simple uh, majority, which was the Palestinian Arabs, a million over a million. They were half a million. They had no, under no illusion 
that they exactly would do to them what the Germans did to them in Europe, okay, if they had only a chance. And so uh, the partition, uh, the United Nations realized that the two people cannot live together, and they decided you get your portion and the other guys get your portion. And the Jews did what was necessary to secure themselves a nation uh, against what the Arab Palestinians uh, and the Arab countries, the slogan was, throw the Jews to the sea. Throw the Jews to the sea. I remember it from my childhood, hearing it on the radio. Excellent. So, so that's the bigger picture, absolutely, for sure. Go ahead, Sylvia. In terms of the refugees is what I'm interested in. I, well, I, from what I know, which is not as much as most of the rest of you know, um, this is, um, I think the Jews uh, of the Western world were pretty united in believing that Israel had to be a country because, um, not just because of what we just said, but also because if there was no place for them to go, when push came to shove, any non-Jew was going to turn on them. Right. They you they you could you couldn't trust non-Jews at all. So we needed to be somewhere. You know. So all of this is important. And from the perspective of the Zionists, look, um, as Michael pointed out, the Peel the Peel uh, Commission in 1937 and uh, the UN Resolution 181 in 1947 offered the Palestinians a land of their own, the Jews a land of their own. And when they rejected that and then chose war instead, they are now responsible for their own refugee problem. And more importantly, um, Palestinians weren't necessarily forced to leave their homes. They did it on their own or they were or encouraged by their um, Arab commanders or local leaders to clear the way for their invading armies because they, don't you know, we're gonna win this magnificent victory over the Zionists. So get out of the way, women and children and come back to your beautiful homes. And so from the perspective of the Zionists, the source of the refugee crisis, the Nakba, wasn't the Zionists. It was the Arab rejection of any compromise and, their, and the Arab decision to make war against the newly born Jewish state that is responsible for this. And therefore, UN Resolution 194 is impossible for them to hold as legitimate. They don't have a legitimate right to wage a war, lose it, and then say, oh, well, now we lost it. We want to come back to the lands that we lost, that we could have had, um, had we just uh, said peacefully, yes, we'll take less than we want. So from the Zionist perspective, UN resolution, and I wanna just contrast this from the Palestinian perspective, th there was ethnic cleansing going on and that they were, they were terrorized. And therefore they have a moral legitimate right to return. And it's recognized by the United Nations, the international community. From the Zionist perspective, the war was against the Jews and the Jews were defending themselves and had been willing to, to grant Palestinians their own territory um, and wanted to, but that was not that was rejected. So once that happens, they have to be responsible for their own refugee problem. Very different perspective. Uh, I'm, I'm to Rosalie. Wait, oh, let pardon. me come to Rosalie first, Michael, and then I'm coming. Just, just a quick question before, and you repeated it again, um, that when they first offered the two different the, the lands to the Zionists and to the Palestinians. The Palestinians had rejected it because they said that their, the land that was being given to them wasn't arable. You didn't use arable, I'm using it. They, they couldn't cultivate on it. You said something like that. Yes. Do you think that's really true or that's just what they say? Because I have a hard time believing that there's so many things that it, the Israelis have done since they are their productivity, water-wise, desalination. And I just, they just didn't want to take any help 
from any of the Zionists. But I may be talking about different times in history. No, no, I think you're. I think you're absolutely right. And if you read um, Shavit, you'll you'll get a very Ari Shavit's book, um, mm -hmm. get a very nice view of that. And I'm going to come to Michael's point right after that, which is that um, a lot of this land that was both for the Arabs and for the Jews wasn't so easy to farm, and the Jews basically did this heroic effort to try to take swamp and desert and rocks and just remove all these things at risk to their own lives and transform these things, right? To make, a, uh, make the desert bloom, so to speak. Um, and it's not true that all of the land was uh, that was given to the Arabs was not cultivatable and uh, all of the land that was given, no, but it was, they were thinking, they were feeling that a lot of the land that was given to the, to the, uh, Jews was the best cultivatable land. But if you look at the map, the Negev, <laughs> it's a desert. That was a giant piece of the pe of the land that was offered in the in the partition plan. So uh, so yeah, but I think you're right. Uh, the, all of these claims have to be understood as participating in a political battle of ideas for which, side had a legitimate claim which side was being just which side was moral all these kinds of things that we're talking about which is why i would think it's so important for us to see the arguments yes michael please i'd like to say uh, make two points uh first i agree with you about uh, the marshes and all the other uh work that the israelis or israeli jews had to invest in order to make the land uh, cultivated the important part is to understand it's not like somebody came and arbitrarily make some borders and gave the good portion to the Jews. After all, the British were not siding with the Jews. Okay, uh, so they were not giving the good portion to the Jews. They gave the Arabs what belongs to the Arabs, and the rest they gave to the Jews. Not the other way around. And number two that I want to say, um, I, I think, I, I'm sorry, there was another point that I want to say, but it skipped my, it skipped my mind. Oh, I know, I, I remember what it was. Um, the biggest mistake, okay, for which I hold them responsible for, is the fact that the grandfather of King Hussein had welcomed the Jews to Israel and welcomed them Okay, he wanted the Jews and, and, and recognized that Jews had a place in, in the land of Palestine. And what did the Palestinians do to him? He was murdered in a mosque. And everybody here needs to know that. And that's how the conflict started. The only they wanted to have the Jews there. Yes, and we're going to see a number of these things. So really very different perspectives. And I just, I, you know, let me just say one other thing. Can I just, can I just, say, can I just say one thing? One, yeah, please go, go okay, ahead. So um, I was in a Zionist organization when I was young, you know, a teenager, Abudim, which was eventually, I think, put on the communist list. But anyway, there were, I knew a lot of people that went over to Israel to cultivate the land. And there was nothing that when there was, the land was was nothing. Right. They had to like start from scratch, and they were willing to do that oh, to sorry. make things I'm grow on that land because they wanted a place of their own. So that's all I have to say. Yeah, you know, I'm sorry I missed that. Like, I cannot teach at home anymore. The next time I teach this class, I'll be in my office. I promise you. I was talking about when I belonged to Habonim, and a lot of the people that oh, went on Habonim. Aliyah. Yeah. And they started kibbutzim, one in the Negev, actually. Right, a one kibbutz, that's right, exactly. Huge. The kibbutzim were all organized they around. They started the kibbutzim through the Zionist organization. Yes. And um, I had pe people in my family that were really very active in that whole situation. So they, right. I, I, I want to juxtapose these two, and I'll just add one more thing about the refugees. There was also an, uh, another argument from the Zionist perspective that it wasn't just Palestinians that had refugees. It was also Jews that became refugees. The invasion by the Arabs 
um, made it uh, impossible for Jews who were residing in their countries. And uh, there was a massive displacement of Jews of a quarter of a million people um, from Morocco, Yemen, Egypt, Iraq, Tunisia. Um, so Palestinians weren't the only people who were displaced by the uh, 1948 war. Um, and so this idea that, oh, it's only, you know, war, war does disrupt everybody. Um, so let me just say a couple more things about this because I think it is really important. Um, from the perspective of the other Arab countries, and I see you have a point, Robin. So let me take that before I move on. Yeah, I was, I'm just asking, um, I get, I hear different estimates of the numbers of Palestinians who were um, displaced. Um, I hear from Palestinians that it was a million, um, which is interesting because I think there were only a million Palestinians in the in in that land at the time. Um, so, and uh, just this morning I read six hundred thousand, and then last week I read two hundred and fifty thousand. Is there any agreement on yes the actual number of di of of dislocated? There's two. Yes, I mean I think. At the time of 1948, there was a United Nations agreement, right? So there was an international estimate of about between 700,000 and 750,000 uh, indigenous Palestinian Arabs were, were uprooted from their homes, okay? Okay. For different reasons, right? Now, one of the reasons why you get those different um, understandings is that um, when you start to talk about the right of return, you have different groups that will say, well, which groups voluntarily left, which groups were forcibly, uh, which, which groups heirs include, right? So if right. you have a maximalist position as a Palestinian, you say every heir, so you're talking about one and a half million Palestinians worldwide who have a right of return. And if you have a minimalist uh, perspective, you might say 600,000 because the other 100,000 voluntarily moved out. Um, so you don't want to say like, just because you moved, you can come back and get your land. Right. It's, it, it is, a again, a very political perspective. Yes, Michael. I, I'm willing to accept the number of 600 to 700,000 uh, uh, refugees, uh, Palestinian refugees. But I want you to understand that this is not the classic refugees that we know about. Okay, Jewish refugees were hundreds of miles away from their homes, okay, and any other kind of which refugees. These people simply dis were displaced from what became Israel and went to the partition that was theirs. That's all it was. They were, they were refugees in their own land. That is the joke of it. Let me, let me, let me just counter that. that. Let me just make last point. It was, I think, in the New York Times, somebody wrote an article that they want the state, and the, and the Palestinians want the state, and when they get the state, they still want their, their compensation as refugees because they're refugees in their own state. That is the joke about it. On the average, a Palestinian refugee moved about 20, 25 miles into the West Bank. That's all there was. But the other part I'd like to make, please, is the United Nations, unfortunately, made in the ruling uh, on the rule or whatever uh, the decision they made that all descendants are also refugees. And so the number of refugees at this day, which are supported by United Nations, are in the millions. Right. That's what I have to say. Yes, that's exactly right. And it's about 1.5 million right now. So just to just to pick up though what, what Michael is saying from the perspective of a Palestinian though, right? In some ways, it's even more painful to be just 10 miles from your home and unable to go there because you were forced out in a military, uh, brutal military attack on civilians, right? If you read the, the, the rendition of what happened by Lida and I sent you a, uh, I hope everyone got that article. And if you get a chance to read it afterwards, you should. 
um, you'll get a sense of what that was, how traumatic and difficult that was. We're talking about human beings caught up in war. Um, and all of this is politicized. I'm not saying anything, but just from that human experience, you can see where the, a lot of this pain and agony is coming out of. Let me talk about the Arab nation's perspective on this. Why Jordan, why Egypt, why Syria looked at United Nations Resolution 181 and reject it. First of all, um, from their perspective, Palestine is part of the Arab world and they had an obligation therefore to support the Palestinians. And secondly, the UN is a colonial body. It's brand new, right? And they had no right to give the Zionists any portion of Arab land, particularly Muslim land, to the Zionists, the uh, Europeans. From their perspective, Europe was simply trying to soothe their own guilt for the atrocities of the Second World War, which is a European war, by paying off their debt to the Jewish people with Arab land. Let that sink in for a second. If you're Arab leaders, if you're the Arab people, right? Israel is seen as a tool by the British and then by the US afterwards, trying to create a hostile state in the heart of the Arab, in the heart of Arab land to prevent Arab unity or even worse, Muslim unity. Um, if you think about Palestine on a map, right? It's in the middle between the East and the West of the Arab world. Um, so putting a non-Arab, predominantly non-Muslim state in the middle of that would make the triumph of a major Arab identity or nationalism impossible. So from their perspective, this issue of Palestine and the Zionism is an issue of for all of the Arabs. Uh, so some of the Arab narratives about the conflict also had some religious overtones. Um, this could be seen as a war between Muslims and Jews over Holy Land and Palestine, or but others saw this in secular nationalist terms. So there's both, like there's this leftist, Marxist, Leninist, anti-colonialist approach, and there's this Islamic uh, 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 narrative that says, this is a war between, uh, uh, between, uh, between Islam and Judaism over the holy places in Palestine. Um, uh, so, I just want to sort of uh, from talk about two specific narratives that I think are going to be really important as we move on. One is Jordan's and one is Egypt's. From Jordan's perspective, um, King Abdul Abdullah is the key player here, um, trans Jordan, I should say. In 1939, Abdullah is a, an emir under the British mandate. And he wants, uh, he, would have, he would have sided with the Palestinian state, um, but a partition, a partition. And he would have been okay with that, right? As Michael pointed out. Um, but back then, both the Palestinians and the Zionists rejected. And so Abdullah kind of felt like he is devoted to the Palestinians, but He's looking at the rest of the Arab world and he's thinking these other Arab leaders don't have any practical sense of how to deal with the Western world. They don't, the Hashemite leaders are thinking, how do you pragmatically deal with the Zionists? Um, yes, Michael, or is that a leftover hand? Okay, um, you tell me if it's uh, appropriate. You mentioned that uh, Israel, is um, a holy place for the Arab the Arab nation for the Islam for the Islam Islam exactly 
and <laughs> and I investigated that. Okay, the, it, it specifically it is Jerusalem. Okay, and I tried to find out whether Jerusalem is mentioned in the Quran. Is it mentioned in the Quran? No. That is zero times. The only time that it's mentioned yeah. that they say it's mentioned is. Well, let me cut you off first, just a second, Michael, and so simplify yeah. things, wait, because I, I, we can get into a long argument about the Islamic claim on the land. From the, from the Arab perspective who are arguing about this, all Arab oh. lands are part of a potential Islamic caliphate. Correct. That's Therefore, fine. Correct. That I agree. But as okay. far as Islam is concerned, the yes. two there are two claims that the Quran uh, the Quran, and they say the Quran mentions Jerusalem not explicitly, okay. As a matter of fact, if at all, if you look in the Quran, God is speaking in the Quran and He says to the Jews, "Go into the land; it's yours." And I managed to say that in the Mission View Mosque uh, several years ago. Beth El had an, an interface exchange. And I went there with the Quran and I showed it to them and they were totally they were struck and they could not, they were very angry with me, especially when I told them I'm Israeli and I showed them exactly, God is speaking, this is your land in the Quran. And, and Jerusalem Michael, is Michael, Michael, you have to know your audience and you have to be mindful that, you know, you could come to the Jews and you could say, you can eat a cheeseburger. It doesn't say you can't eat a cheeseburger in there. And right, it's like, we could be oh you know let people interpret their own scriptures but you're but 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 i'm pointing out conversation what do you mean like i'm conversing with you i will argue with you and the rabbi fine with me fine with me. But, fine with me. But, but let me just let me just finish this because i want to just finish this thought about uh yes. go ahead so and then i'll come to to your point okay Go ahead, go ahead, Rosalie. I, I don't want to cut you off, Rosalie. And oh, then... Well, this is written by a, um, an Arab journalist um, and I have it in front of me. Um, in fact, the Quran says nothing about Jerusalem. It mentions Mecca hundreds of times. It mentions Medina countless times. It never mentions Jerusalem with good reason. There is no historical evidence to suggest Muhammad ever visited Jerusalem. Yes. Oh. Yeah, no, it's no. It's one important. Arab's I mean, point there, there are definitely ways in which the Islamic religion shares the Abrahamic roots. And of course, that's why Hebron and that's why the, the, the Temple Mount is important. Um, but but I, I don't think we, un, we need to get into theological arguments about Islam to understand that there's a desire for, there, there's a way in which Pan-Arab nationalism can be rooted in Islamic faith as well as um, Marxist-Leninist anti-colonial uh, uh, resistance to Zionism, both resisted Zionism. But go ahead, Robin. Can't hear you, dear. You're muted. Um, I want to say how much I appreciated what um, Rhea wrote in the um, in the chat. Because, you know, I listen to Rosalie and I, I listen to Michael and, and certainly I, you know, we probably all of us know those positions and, and are well aware of, you know, the, I don't want to say the Hasbra, um, but, you know, we have our talking points. We, we know all of this. Um, but, you know, Rhea's point of view is, it, from what I read from Rhea's point of view is that, that it's important for us to real not have you know not argue back against what they're saying. I mean, there there's a lot to be said for um, refuting the arguments that that the Palestinians of the time might have been making. But I think it's also very important for us to be able to recognize that you know as events in 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 history unfold we are but people and we, you know, we are, everybody is making mistakes in all of this. Um, yeah, I really appreciate and, and, you saying that. Yeah, and I think it's really important to, I, I, I also wanna say that the idea that, oh, well, 
you know, the Palestinian dislocation wasn't that important. Um, in so many ways, I can, I can think about, like, I think about my family in, um, in Prussia who lose their citizenship in that region and are there and, and still have to live there because they have no other alternatives. I mean, just imagine what that is like to be stripped of your citizenship, your residency. And, you know, quite frankly, if you don't own anything, moving 30 miles might as well be 300 miles. So when you're stripped of your, 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 stripped of your, 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 your country, you're stripped of your possessions, um, you know, how many, it, it's happened to us. And, and, you know, I think we have to be empathetic to that. And so that's all I wanted to say. No, and I, and I, and, and from another perspective, which I think is the one that I'm adopting in this class, which is also of empathy, but more importantly, analytic, to try to understand the, the roots of this conflict without saying, with, with, with from a, uni, from a uh, biased perspective, misses so much. I'm not saying that the Zionist perspective is wrong or that the Palestinian perspective is the better perspective. I'm saying we need to understand them for, on their own terms because <laughs> politically they have great deal of importance over the long term. And I know everybody here agrees with that. So let me just highlight two that are particularly important moving into the post-war uh, period, and then we'll start there. Um, King Abdullah, right, uh, puts together this Arab Legion, the Jordan Arab Legion, right? Um, and uh, fights to retain control over Jerusalem from the perspective of the Jordanian, right? That, that's really important. While the Arab League set up an all Palestinian government in Gaza, an APG, the APG was set up in Gaza under the Egyptians. So you got Jordan over here saying, we're going to retain Jerusalem for the Arabs, <laughs> including the Jewish quarter of Jerusalem, uh, old Jerusalem. And you've got Egypt saying, no, 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 we're going to have this all Palestinian government after the war in Gaza. Um, and it's led worse from the perspective of Abdullah by Hajamin al husseini who Abdullah saw as undermining the entire Palestinian cause. And, and by the way, right, I mean, he's looking at it pragmatically and saying, like, this guy is the one who got exiled by the British and then tried to connect up with Hitler. And now Egypt is saying, oh no, he's gonna be the leader of the Palestinian cause. And Abdullah is saying, this is ridiculous, right? Um, he was also very pissed off at Egypt. He would, had, during the war, Abdullah had counted on Egypt mounting an attack up through the Negev, um, which never happened. It kind of like was like stuck there. And Jordan was left in charge of all of the Arab forces. And the Arab armies, none of the other countries are, are willing to commit enough force to actually win the war. He's also opposed to the internationalization of the conflict, and particularly of Jerusalem. He wants the Arab states to uphold a ceasefire um, early on in the war so the Arab armies the Arab, uh, the, could restock and get ready. And Egypt jumps back in. Syria jumps back in. They don't even get, nobody's listening to him. He's in charge of the Arab forces, but nobody's listening to him. And so without arms, without equipment, that's why the Arab Legion, the Jordanian Arab Legion withdraws from Lida and Ramla back into the West Bank. The rest of the Arabs accused Jordan of abandoning Lida and Ramla. He, he couldn't have won, he said, right? We couldn't have won. We had no support, right? Um, 
in general, Abdullah sees this lack of a unified Arab command and, the deter and a lack of determination on the part of the Arabs as the main reason for their defeat in 1948. So when he annexes the entire West Bank after the war, he feels that that's his patriotic bond between Jordan and his Palestinian brothers. Um, now, from Egypt's uh, perspective, um, let me go back a little bit here. I'm sorry, I'm jumping all over the place. From Egypt's perspective, the reason why the Arabs lost this war is it's Britain's fault, <laughs> right? They dragged Egypt into the war. They didn't prepare Egypt for it. Um, and the only reason Britain wanted Egypt in the war was because Britain was losing power in the Arab world. Britain's losing power of the world wide over to the United States. And if the US is gonna support the Zionists, then the Brits move over to the side of the Arabs and, and, that, the, and Egypt is their, their toehold, right? Uh, but Britain wants what Britain wants. And um, they want control over the Suez Canal. They don't want Egypt to have control of the Suez Canal, even though it's in Egypt's backyard. That means that the Egypt's military isn't allowed to be powerful. It's allowed to be powerful enough to fight the Zionists, but not powerful enough to fight the British, uh, which means it's not powerful enough to win the war. Uh, so they have enough weapons to start the fighting, but not enough weapons to continue all the way through. Um, and so from the perspective of Egypt and Jordan, it's, there are two problems. Britain is too weak and not willing to supply the Arab armies with what they need to do to win. And it's a disunified Arab world. In the end, right, from the, from the uh, in the analysis, right, uh, one question that we can ask is why, why is this Palestinian-Israeli war becoming an Arab conflict with Israel? How did that happen? And then secondly, we can ask, you know, from a big perspective, how did Israel win this, considering the odds were so stacked against them? Um, and the answer of why this became an Arab issue is the Arab nations, each one of them had their own desires, right? As I pointed out, Egypt and Jordan want control over the territories uh, that the Palestinians was, were given in 1947. The Egypt, and they, they want those, right? Um, Jordan comes, jumps in and annexes the West Bank and East Jerusalem. Egypt wants to maintain military control over Gaza. They don't want, uh, they're, they're willing to uh, tolerate Palestinian nationalist sentiments growing in Gaza. They don't, want, they don't want to annex Gaza, but they want to control that area and they want to make sure that the Palestinians never get institutional uh, power. Right. Um, so when Britain starts to lose its power, it creates a vacuum. As they start to back off the mandate rule, um, and all of these countries, Jordan and Egypt and Syria and Iraq, uh, are engaged in balancing their own needs against all of the other potential powers of the other nations. So this emergence of a Zionist independence movement and a Palestinian independence movement happens amidst this incredible uncertainty. Um, there is no single institution that can unify these Arab countries, but rather Jordan sees Egypt as a, and Syria as a competitor. Syria sees Jordan as a competitor. They're all worried that one country gets more than the other and becomes a danger to the to each other. There's this what we call in political science a security le a dilemma. What a security dilemma is, any effort by one country to strengthen itself is seen by all the other surrounding countries as a danger to them. 
And so then they will strengthen themselves, which is seen as a danger to the other countries. And so you ratchet up this uncertainty and danger when each country is just looking out for their own selves. Jordan seeking the uh, annexation of, 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 the, um, of the West Bank was a commitment to hold on to an area without advancing a broader attack that might have helped win that war. Jordan was actually the most militarily um, equipped country in this war, and yet they were they had a very limited objective: hold on to the to to the West Bank. That was it. Um, you know, the biggest uh, uh, in Egypt um, was basically trying to retain its independence um, and make sure that the British um, did not have too much power in the air, in its backyard around the Suez Canal. So Egypt, Jordan, Syria, Saudi Arabia, each had different interests, different, all competing with each other. I don't want to go into all the details of this because it would take too long. But my point, my, but if you're trying to understand how Israel ends up winning, Israel's unified, <laughs> right? Ben-Gurion, one of his great strengths is that in 1946, he understands that this is going to be our war with the Palestinians in the in the Palestinian mandate, uh, irregular forces as they're called, is about to change to a military confrontation with Arab nations. And in 1946, Ben Gurion realized this, and he goes through this whole process where he starts to interview the top military leadership in in the issue, and he finds out. Which one of these guys are equipped for fighting Arabs, Arab uh, terrorism in, in the Yeshuv? And which of these have experience fighting military conflicts? And quite a few had experience in military conflicts from either World War I or World War II or both um, in Europe. And he elevates all of the, the leaders, all of the generals, all of the military who have experience with military conflict to the top of the defense. He, he brokers a deal between all these dissident groups, the Irgun, the Lehi, Le Le and uh, the Haganah. Um, and he says, look, we have to draw together whatever differences we have. We're going to be fighting for our, our, our lives. Let's pull together under one single unified leadership. And he's effective in doing that. And then thirdly, he presides over the stealing of uh, tons of arms, as I pointed out last week, um, from caches of weapons all through that, the Middle East, but also in Europe, um, and starts to get ready for this war. So Ben-Gurion, two years before the war, is already engaged in fighting and getting ready for this war. The Palestinian leadership is ill-equipped for that. They don't even have a leadership. Their leaders are exiled. The elites are fighting with each other. The Nashashibis and Al Husseinis are fighting with each other. You've got Arab countries that are all out for their own, um, you know, their own benefit, um, and thinking about what's going to happen with this land in Palestine, and and if they stand back and allow the other countries to to do what they do, um, will they be able to do that? I don't know how that happened. This this thumbs up, but anyway. Um, uh, how do I get it off? Oh, I don't know. Oh, <laughs> well, I don't mean to do that. So anyway, <laughs> um, but uh, but the point I'm trying to make is that the Ben Gurion unifies the the country. There's no such leadership on the Palestinian side. Um, the, the the arguments after the war are 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 uh, are also. Uh, um, there's also an inequality in that, right? The the because of the Holocaust, because of the uh, 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 the international United Nations body involved, because it's one ba baby country fighting against all these Arab countries, the rest of the world sees Israel's victory as legitimate and just. Um, and even though Israel gets more territory than it was allotted under the UN partition plan. Uh, the armistice agreements are seen by the rest of the international community as just. It's only the Arab countries that reject 
what happens afterwards. Um, and so this is sort of where we stand in 1949. Um, I think I have like three minutes left, so I'm not gonna say much. I'm not gonna show you my PowerPoint. Um, let me say this. In the years between 1949, 1950, and 1967, um, there's this very significant set of changes that happen in terms of the systemic role of uh, Britain, the Soviet Union becomes a, an important player. Um, there's a, a all out war with the Suez Sinai crisis in 1956. Um, and all of these things, uh, set up some new systemic power uh, considerations. And in particular, the Cold War becomes a dominant piece of what happens in the Middle East. And I'm struck as I think about what happens in 48 and again in 67 and how, how um, I don't want to use the word dependent. That's not the, quite the right word, um, but how... Uh, sensitive Israel's conflict with its Arab neighbors are in particular the Palestinians are to these other powerful world forces. The decolonization and the decline of the British empire is an incredibly important aspect of what happens in 1948. The rising power of the Soviet Union and its role in uh, our allies. Um, mine. Hi. Um, it's allies with the um, uh, with Egypt in particular uh, can you, becomes incredibly um, important in I'm in shaping my car over. the lead up to the 1967 war. Debbie, you're you're on. You're not on mute. Okay, thank you. <laughs> All right. So um, I'll, I'll open it up for any other comments right now because I don't have time to really get into that in any kind of detail. Um, and we'll, we'll pr I'll probably add another week if it's okay with you guys um, to the course, just one extra week. Uh, next time I see you won't be until a, a week, two weeks from now because of Pesach, because I need a little break. Okay, I gotta go, bye. Okay, so Michael. You have a point. Please. Yeah, I want to say to uh, submit a question. So here we are, 75 years later. Mm -hmm. uh, Jews uh, take some of the blame and uh, even discuss it between us. Uh, question is whether one, the Palestinian uh, speak between themselves and want to have peace. I recently was corresponding with somebody that you have noticed uh, in the email. And I asked him to show me one song of peace from the Palestinians, 75 years later. Let's make peace and resolve the differences. And the question is, why is that there's no peace initiative or movement of any sort on the Palestinian side, while everything is coming from the Jewish side, we all willing to take all the blame and B'Tselem and so many other organizations nothing is coming from their side. 75 years later, it's well, not their I will disagree with you respectively, respectfully and just say that I think there are a lot of efforts by... Um, Individuals, uh, yes. Tell me an organization that is uh, working within the Palestinian, among the Palestinians whose, mo whose purpose is to promote peace with the Jews. And also show me one song among the Palestinians, a song for peace, like the one Rabin gave his life for. And okay. I have many, many of them. I, the song you piece I can't able to, myself, uh, please, I you won't be able to. I, the song piece I can't, I, I can't speak to, but I can certainly come up with um, Palestinian group, particularly the Arab, uh, uh, the Arab, there are a lot of group, uh, cross, uh, cultural organizations between Arabs. Long Hartman Institute. Can you give me a name of good a Palestinian group who wants peace with Israel. That's all I'm Okay. I'm sure there's people working on it. We just uh, don't know. People are working, yes, but you will not find them. Okay. 
All right, listen, let, let me let me take uh, Ria's uh, point and question. Uh, go ahead. Okay, uh, I'm taking this class in order to hear various voices. I'm my interest is both as a Zionist and also as an amateur historian. And you, if you block out with the voices you only want to hear, you don't get a full picture. It is unsatisfactory. If I wanted a course that was given by Michael, then I would not hear other voices. And, but I would do it knowing I was not gonna hear other voices. I'm taking this class because I wanna hear all the voices. Michael wants to hear the Palestinian voices who wants to speak. Uh, That's what Michael, Michael, I am, am taking this course because it's being taught by Scott Spitzer. We ask questions and we give little side things, but we don't dominate with our own point of view. Okay. Well, let me just say, I, I, I thank you, Ria. I, I feel I feel fine with what Michael's raising, and and I and I do understand what his con concern. What I would just say is this: um, uh, I do think that the the experience of 1948, um, and if for the the people the, that call themselves Palestinians or the Palestinian people, was absolutely traumatic. Not just because of the the devastation. Uh, in the loss of the war, but also considering that the Arab countries that claimed to be fighting on their behalf were fighting on their own behalf, that after the war, there was no effort to establish an, uh, an independent state by any Arab nation, that um, the Jordanians essentially said, don't even call yourself Palestinian, call yourself only Jordanian. And so with a devastated leadership, a, a bankrupt leadership, frankly, and uh, Haj Amin al-Husseini long before he sat down with Hitler was already deeply problematic. And in fact, we, as I tried to point out, I don't think very effectively, in the 1936 to 1939 revolt um, was offered an opportunity to work with, right? He squandered an opportunity to work with the British who were moving towards the Palestinian position at that point in time. Um, and so there were many opportunities, and this is not from me, this is from Rashid Khalidi, the Palestinian scholar, um, who said that, you know, in fighting among elite uh, Palestinian leaders at a time, at a critical time, when the Jews were very effective at state building, um, set the Palestinians up for ultimate failure. So before the 48 war, they had already lost. They had already lost. And I think this was the critical um, issue from my perspective in trying to analyze this. Now, if you wanna understand the resistance of a Palestinian uh, peace to, to any kind of peace movement, it's hard for the victim, if you see yourself as the victim, so this is a partial answer to you, Michael. Um, if you feel that you've been unjustly victimized, um, then your perception of Israeli peace songs is that it's uh, it, it's it's completely um, it's 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 ignoring the reality of how the Palestinian people were ultimately disenfranchised and. Uh, uh, cleansed, uh, you know, moved out of their land, their rightful homeland. So from their perspective, and I'm trying to state it as strongly as possible, um, you know, and uh, Rashid Khalidi will say, you know, um, the, the, and I'll just end with this, that the, um, my point will end with this and I'll come to you, Robin. That, so the title of Rashid Khalidi's book, which I recommend is called The Iron Cage. And The Iron Cage, the argument is as follows. Palestinians were told that if they participate in state building under the mandate, if they accept the later, if they accept the partition plan, that they will have 
institutions that they will have land, their own land. But by doing so, they, to, they would implicitly have to recognize the Zionist right to land in their, uh, there, in their, in Palestine. And from their perspective is that was uh, their land. They were there, they were pushed out. And so saying it's okay for people to take over your land, Europeans to take over your land, um, is not something they wanted to participate in. But Khalidi also says that there was a lack of pragmatism, a lack of understanding of what they were up against um, in, the, in the late 30s and in the early 40s. And by the time they kind of started to realize this, by the 60s, it was long gone. It was, that train had left the station. So um, Palestinians were very poorly served by their own leaders. And um, this is a big piece of what, uh, what a lot of Palestinian scholars are arguing. Go ahead, Robin, please. No, actually, I know I've been speaking a lot. And so I'll step back for anyone else who wants to, uh, who has something else to say. So I'll just lower my hand. So next, so what I want to do um, for the next class is I'm going to begin with a sort of build up to the 67 war. And um, I'm going to really think a lot about what happened with these armistice agreements and how they were thought of by both sides between Israel and Jordan, Israel and Lebanon, Israel and Egypt. Um, and particularly with Egypt, how uh, Israel's concerns with their uh Southwest border um, started to become a problematic issue for them on the Sinai, in the Sinai, and uh, we'll we'll get into this the the Sinai War as the beginning of the in my perspective 1956 uh, Suez Sinai War as a the beginning of the 1967 Six Day War. And that'll take us right up to the uh, um, beginning of that war. And then the, the, the class after we'll do the narratives just like this, okay? So typically that's how I end up uh, processing things. Um, I wanna wish everybody a Hag uh, Sameach and a beautiful, um, a beautiful and uh, meaningful Passover. And I'll, I'm, I'll wait and answer a few more questions if you need to. Um, but anyone else is feel please feel free to to leave if you want to. I'll also. Th th thanks, Scott. This is really just what the kind.